Good morning. Welcome to the Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center Grand Rounds. Before introducing our speaker, there are some housekeeping items we need to take care of. Broadcasting, we are broadcasting live via live stream and YouTube. Please use the microphones to ask questions so our live stream audience can hear them. The recording will remain available for viewing at a later time. Consider subscribing to our YouTube channel to get notifications when new videos are added. For our viewers, if you would like to submit a question, text the Bakey, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, to 37607. Again, 37607. You may also submit your questions via the live stream feed. We will try to read them out to our speaker uh, as time permits. Um, our next conferences are Robotic Vascular Surgery Summit uh, on March 25th, Heart of a Woman on April 27th, and Cardiovascular Prevention on May 4th. Now, without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Rafael Alonso Gonzalez, joining us all the way from Toronto. Dr. Alonso's journey is a testament to the adventurous spirit of medicine. He graduated from Universidad de Navarra in Pamplona, Spain. He completed his cardiology and pulmonary hypertension training in Badajoz and Madrid. He initially set his sights on becoming a pulmonary hypertension specialist in his homeland, Spain. However, fate had a twist in store for him. Encouraged by his mentors, he pursued training in adult congenital heart disease to become a more comprehensive pulmonary hypertension specialist. And as they say, as they say the heart wants what it wants. The, the, rest, the rest is history. Can we blame him for falling head over heels for ACHD during his training? He became an ACHD cardiologist and never looked back. After completing his ACHD fellowship at the Royal Brompton in London, a global leader in ACHD care and training, he was appointed as faculty as an ACHD cardiologist and pulmonary hypertension specialist. While in London, he led the ACHD inpatient services and played a pivotal role in establishing a pioneering ACHD heart failure unit. In 2018, Dr. Alonso took his expertise across the pond to another vibrant ACHD program in Toronto. Since 2021, he serves as the director of this leading program. Dr. Alonso isn't just a trailblazer on clinical care, he's also a passionate educator, serving as the ACHD Fellowship Program Director at Toronto University. His commitment to education knows no bounds as he leads initiatives as the, like the Toronto International ACHD Grand Rounds, and he frequently lectures uh, in Spanish in Spain and Latin America. His grand runs presentations couldn't come at a better time. With the growth of our ACHD multi-organ transplant program at Houston Methodist, there is a palpable eagerness among our multidisciplinary faculty, fellows, and staff who are dedicating to supporting these patients throughout the ups and downs of their transplant journey. Dr. Alonso, welcome to the Houston Methodist. The stage is all yours. Let's give him a warm Houston welcome. Thank you, Valeria, for the longest ever introduction I had. <laughs> but, uh, and thank you, everyone, for having me here. It's a, a great pleasure to, to be with you here today. And uh, Valeria asked me to talk about lessons I, I, I learned from, uh, from uh, in heart transplant and congenital heart disease from the time I've been doing this. So I, uh, what I'm I, I going to tell you is, is what we do or how we do it and and what we have or i personally have learned over the years just transplanting these patients so i have no conference of interest to declare so of course it's impossible to talk about transplant without talking about heart failure so we'll talk about a little bit of heart failure and heart disease 
very little about medical therapy. It's not a half a, 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 half a talk. We, I'll talk about the issues of the heart, heart transplant in congenital heart disease patients. And then I will focus on what is, what is the role of having an ACSD heart failure program, which is exactly what, what we have in Toronto and what we had in London as well. I always like to start my half failure talks in congenital heart disease with this slide. And I think it's just to remind all of us that over the last years, if anything we have done well, is to improve the survival of babies that are born with congenital heart disease. And this is to the point that nowadays eight of 10 patients with, uh, born with congenital heart disease make it to adulthood. And if you just look, uh, if you is, uh, ignore those that die in the first year, the survival is up to 95%, even almost 90% for those that are complex congenital heart disease patients. And that is only good news. To the, of course, that has a consequence, and now nowadays the number of adult patients with congenital heart disease has already surpassed the number of pediatric patients with congenital heart disease in almost every unit in the Western world. But of course, our patients are treated, but they are not cured, and uh, we repeat that to them all the time. And one of the biggest risks uh, that they have during their lifespan is to develop heart failure. This is a very nice study uh, from uh, Sweden that they look at uh, 20,000 patients with, uh, born with congenital heart disease and they follow them for 40 years and they compare the risk of developing heart failure uh, with, uh, compare, or they assess the risk of developing heart failure compared to the general population. And not surprisingly, they found that if you are born with heart failure, you have 104 uh, higher risk of developing, uh, sorry, if you are born with congenital heart disease, you have a hundredfold risk of developing heart failure during uh, your lifespan, and this is following them only until 40 years of age. But even more, if you are, if you are born with a complex congenital heart disease, one in seven will develop heart failure. But I think one of the most important things of this study is, of course, obvious that in pink you have the patients with congenital heart disease and in blue patients with non congenital heart disease. Obviously, that if you are born with a congenital heart disease, you have a higher risk of that. But in the right panel, you see what the difference is if you have congenital heart disease and you develop heart failure. You have a 65% risk of death during your lifespan. The Mayo Clinic has recently looked at, her, at their population, and uh, in the 5,000 patients, they found that an incidence of heart failure of 1.1% per year, which is, uh, is, is about right. And uh, when they look at, uh, at what um, patients, they have a, a higher risk of developing heart failure. Patients with complex congenital heart disease have a threefold a, a higher risk of developing heart failure. And they, in their cohort, complex was patients with uh, systemic RV of, or with single ventricle. But the most important part of this study is that if they follow the, they follow the patients for seven years, and the risk of mortality was six-fold in those that uh, develop heart failure. So heart failure is present, but also is deadly for our population. This is a recent paper published at the end of last year with data from the US of admissions of, in, of patients with congenital heart disease and admissions for heart failure. And they look at uh, 26 patients, admis uh, 26 admissions for heart failure in the country. 5,000 of them were, or almost 6,000 of them were congenital heart disease patients. And you can see that over the last 20, uh, 10 years, the number of admissions for heart failure and congenital heart disease has doubled. And this is only going to go higher. So, and what happened with our patients when die? This is another US study that, uh, so when die, no, when they are admitted with heart failure. This is another study from the US that they look at uh, all patients that came to the ER with heart failure and they divided them in congenital and non-congenital. And they see that if you have a congenital heart disease and you make it to the ER, you are more likely to be admitted, and also you are more likely to die, So, which is not, not a surprise. But if we look at what patients really, uh, um, what is the main difference between the heart failure and congenital disease in heart patients and non-congenital patients is mainly the age of our patients. Our single ventricles will make it to the, to the ER for heart failure in the younger, uh, tw in their 20s or 30s. Our, our biventricular hearts, they make it in the, in the later in life. 
But the, av the average age of our patients with heart failure is younger than patients with heart failure with acquired heart disease, which is going to be a problem when we have to, to offer them options. It's true that heart failure in congenital heart disease is no different than heart failure in acquired heart disease in terms of risk factors. This is a paper from Quebec that they look at uh, risk factors of heart failure in congenital heart disease, and they develop this score where uh, uh, if you have more than eight risk factors of that table that is there, your risk of developing heart failure is exponential. So I think we are quite clear that, that we have a population that is a higher risk of developing heart failure, have a higher mortality. We can probably predict who is going to develop heart failure, but the problem is what to do with them. So when we are do general cardiology and look after general cardiology heart failure patients is, well, just they can do clinic, we treat them and, uh, and, and great, they, we can increase survival. In these patients is like, you know, that's just how I feel every time that I have a new patient coming to my clinic and what I do now. I think to understand how failure and congenital heart disease and the role of transplantation, yeah, all of us, we need to understand what is our population, right? All of us understand this and everyone that even the, the non-congenital heart disease providers understand that our patients are different. Look, they have only one chamber, they're weird. And uh, so they have different anatomies and, defini uh, and definitely that makes them different. But I believe that what makes heart failure and congenital heart disease different actually is not the anatomy, but the physiology of our patients. So we have condition, things that we only have in congenital heart disease patients, like preload dependent circulation. It's a concept that does not exist in, in, a, in, a, in a acquired heart disease uh, uh, patients. We have patients with have a higher uh, secondary hyperaldosteronism that you have to treat. Otherwise, it's quite difficult to manage them. Patients that have a cyanosis, have right to left chance, things that are going to make the heart failure management more challenging. And of course, it's not, uh, this is one of, one of my favorite studies, a very old study, but it's a, 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 I think uh, this 20, the 10 years later, still representing the difference between the two worlds. If you have an acquired heart disease, uh, heart failure patients, the base of your pyramid is the neurohormonal modulation. That's what we do to them, give treatment, give medication, and do things afterwards. If you look what we do in congenital heart disease, if we have somebody with heart failure, First, we're gonna look at what is wrong, is anything to fix, and just at the top, uh, uh, we have the neurohormonal modulation. And the, re the reason is because even nowadays, and it's, this is 10 years later of this study, we still not have much evidence of what to do with, uh, for, with medical therapy for this population. It's not all bad news. There's, uh, there is uh, some good news, and uh, the good news is that most of our patients have two chambers and have a systemic left ventricle. And these are data from, uh, from last year from the Mayo Clinic that they look at their population with heart failure. And they prove that if you, are, if you have congenital heart disease, regardless of your congenital heart disease, but you have a systemic left ventricle and you have heart failure, guideline medical therapy, including CRT, works and improves outcomes. So if you have a patient with a normal, a, a, a biventricular heart and systemic LV, we should, there is no reason not to treat them equally than any other patient with acquired heart disease. The problem is that we have those patients, that you have those patients, but we also deal with other patients like patients with systemic right ventricle. And I'm not gonna go into detail on guideline medical therapy in systemic RV, but the evidence is minimum and uh, there is no study that has, has shown improved survival and there is now what has been published in the last year, in the last two years, three studies with Entresto, three of them have proven that you might increase ejection fraction if you measure ejection fraction with a strain, might increase or increase six minute walk distance but there is no study that improves survival and just Two months ago, it's been published, the first study with the CLT2, which again is probably a promising drug, but up to today, we have no medication to give to these patients that improve survival. Something we have to consider when we treat them, because if we treat somebody with a medication that doesn't improve survival, we might have or should think about transplant uh, earlier than any other population let alone the single ventricle. So I also love these two studies because in single ventricle in here, we have no data whatsoever. There's only one single study with an kids 
that didn't work. The pediatricians are still using it. But this is a very interesting, th these are two ve very interesting studies. This is two surveys done, uh, two surveys done. One, the left is in Europe, the right is in the US. And they ask pro uh, ACSD providers, do you treat your single ventricles? And if, do, uh, if you do, why do you do it? As you can see, almost every single doctor treats the patient with single ventricle because we are desperate, we have to do something, and we doctors cannot be cannot just let them alone, we have to give them something, but this, I think I, this is what I call doctor's therapy, no patient's therapy, because we have no evidence. And why we treat them? For the same reason we treat that quite hard disease patients, patients who have ventricular systolic dysfunction, or patients that have AV valve regurgitation. But the bottom line is we have no evidence to guide uh, to do medical therapy in patients with congenital heart disease. And this is all we're going to talk about what is heart failure, because basically, when you have a patient with congenital heart disease and you have no evidence in medical therapy, you have to think about transplant earlier. And thinking about transplant is, is something that we are not used to. We always try to, uh, uh, to use all the resources medically we have, and sometimes we get late when we in, in congenital heart disease patients if we don't think early about transplant. Also, transplant had this bad news that patients with congenital heart disease die in transplant and, 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 um, and we will see that things have changed. But transplant comes with a lot of questions. So these are some of random questions that I put there. When I should refer my patient? That I think if anybody can have the answer to that question, by the way, I know I'm gonna give you the answer today because it's the one million dollar question. What should trigger the referral? Is the patient feels unwell or does he just have ascites? What, what is the trigger to send the patient to transplant assessment? And we should do transplant or should, should correct that AV valve that is regard, it has a severe regurgitation and we might buy some time to the patient. What symptoms do I need to look for? Do these patients have normal symptoms? Do a heart, do a heart and liver? Wh when we do a heart and liver? When we do a heart only in patients with Fontan? Shall we do this in a pediatric or in an adult center? It's better to transplant this patient in a pediatric environment with, with a, a congenital heart disease team in pediatrics or in adults, you know, it's here in the US a, a both, both, both goals happen, and, uh, and what is better? We really don't know, but there's some, some news that came out from, uh, from, uh, from this paper last year, which is uh, for many years we had been complaining that we did not increase the number of transplant in congenital heart disease. These are data from the US. As you can see, in the last eight years, we have doubled the number of transplants in congenital heart disease patients. And this is a, a US data, but is, is, being, is true in Europe and it's also true in Canada. But the, better, the best news of this paper is actually we also have improved the survival. So on the left panel, you see is the first year survival. In blue is patients with single ventricle. In purple is patients with uh, a systemic right ventricle. Sorry, and patients with, uh, with um, biventricular heart, congenital heart disease. And in yellow is patients with acquired heart disease. As you can see first, if you have a, a biventricular heart and, and congenital heart disease, your survival is exactly the same than a patient with an acquired heart disease. So there is no reason not to transplant these patients. The Fontan, with this, if, if you remember early graphs of Fontan uh, transplant, the mortality was la something like this. Mortality perioperative was around 25% uh, and after the patient survived. But you can see we got much better in the perioperative period. The first year is still an attrition rate, so patients die during the first year, mainly the hypoplast. But look at this, this is the, the, the best news that you can have for a transplant. If you make it to a first year, and you make it to three years, you're, and you have a ventricular heart, your survival is much better than acquired heart disease patients. So at 10 years, our patients live more longer than patients with acquired heart disease. But look at the fontans. If you are a fontan, you get transplanted and you make it to five years, your survival is exactly the same than a quiet heart disease patient. Look at the survival of 10 years, exactly the same for a univentricular heart and a biventricular heart. So if we improve what we do here, we probably will make these patients to, to, to reach the same survival even earlier than five years. Because I believe that the mortality in the fontan is depends pretty much of what you do during the transplant and peritransplant and the first year of, of managing the patient post-transplant. A Fontan patient 
is still a fontan after transplant. Have a, the patient has a heart with, with, with four chambers, before had three or two or one, but, uh, but still having a multisystemic disorder, which is a fontan syndrome. Of course, transplant cases, they come with their challenge, challenge that all of you know. The patient feels well. For those that look after patients with chronic heart disease, look, you know, I'm okay. I, and, and the patients, these patients adapt. They were born with, with a condition that all their life they have to adapt. I saw a patient the other day that I think he's not in class four, I, I quote him in class five, because he can do nothing, but he thinks he's okay. He can barely walk from here to the door. But it does me, it's my normal day. Uh, and, 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 and they feel well. So convincing them and convincing other providers that they are, they are not well is a problem. So then, we don't know when to refer them from transplant because you know, you're actually doing well and you can die the day of the transplant. So wh when to refer this patient is a, is a problem, a problem that all of us have and difficult to pull that trigger, okay, now is the time. But we have to consider that they have a longer uh, transplant assessment. Assessing a patient with a single ventricle for transplant is not as easy as a cardiomyopathy patient that have a dilated cardiomyopathy that is straightforward. It's a lot of people involved in the assessment, a lot of uh, multi-organs that we have to assess that is, is, uh, need experts' opinions and takes much longer to assess the patient. And also they have a longer waiting time that we have not got over this. It's just, you know, of course they are more sensitized and, uh, and that increases their, their longer their waiting time, but also depends what program you are. You know, a, a friend of mine that is a cardiac surgeon, he told me, well, you know, if it's three o'clock in the morning, I have two organs and the patient is have the same, the same uh, uh, at the same level, a, a, a congenital, a non-congenital, well, I might transplant the non-congenital because, you know, uh, it's, it's easy to transplant. So, so it still happen. It shouldn't happen, but those things happen. So have a longer waiting time. And of course, they have a higher mortality on the waiting list because if we, trans if we list them later and they wait longer, they're going to have a higher mortality. And when we get there and we think that, uh, that uh, they are transplanted and, you know, everything is very successful, actually they, they have a higher peritransplant mortality as well. So it's a very difficult journey with a, a, lot, of, a lot of hurdles that we have to, to go through. So I'm going to try to answer some of your, question, uh, of, of your questions. And because uh, Valeria asked me uh, to lessons I learned, I just put four lessons that I learned I, I, I've been doing this for over the last 12 years of my life, is, uh, and, and things that I, I learn is what I'm going to share with you. The first thing I learn is that I don't know when to, trans when to refer a patient for transplant, but what I do know is that to determine the perfect timing, the, these patients benefit from a longitudinal follow-up in an ACSD heart failure clinic by the same provider that knows them early and can identify small changes that can tell you when to refer the patient for transplant. And that is because this is our, our, the journey of our patients. In blue, you can see the journey of an acquired heart disease patient. They are okay. They have an insult. They have, they have an MI. They don't do well. They, or they, they, we treat them. They have a, a stability period. They have a half failure admission. We, tra we list them. We transplant them. That's it. When I have these patients are like this. So they are, they are already born with a problem. They have an operation. They might go back to baseline. They have another operation. They might die, actually. They might get better. They might get worse. And after, it's just a roller coaster. And when we get here, they are so used to be abnormal that it might be too late to send them for transplant. And that is one of the reasons that they have a higher mortality. Let alone if we, the definition of heart failure. So this is the definition from the guidelines, which I'm not going to read. And this is when we, you are a, a cardiologist, this is what you expect to see, no? Patients that have heart failures, patients that come with, with, with uh, ortonia, PND, they have JVP elevated, they have uh, peripheral edema. Uh, th this is what you expect. Well, if you do heart failure in congenital heart disease, you can't expect anything because they can have this, but also it's more typical, they're gonna have unusual symptoms. I don't say that our patients don't have typical symptoms. Don't, that, thank goodness, they do. So they have breathlessness, they have orthopnea, they have PND, they have peripheral edema. But they are more likely to have things like poor concentration, low mood, they feel tired, 
they, can, they cannot work. That's, that's for me, is the, the, the first red flag. When a frontal patient comes in clinic and say, well, I cannot do my work. I just need two days to recover. That's something that is, is a red flag, because you know that something is wrong. They might have more frequent arrhythmias, so you just, it's, more, it's common that when this has fell, they have more arrhythmia. They have, they have ascites, they have diarrhea. Uh, uh, diarrhea might sound uh, uh, unusual, but if you have a fontan and you have a lot of diarrhea, you might have PLE, which might be a problem, an uh, uh, indication to transplant these patients. They have a lot of exercise intolerance, and they have two organs that we always, uh, uh, if we do cognitive heart disease, uh, we look after them, and we have to consider and look at them very closely when we are monitoring these patients or following these patients in the, in the heart failure clinic, which is the liver and the kidneys. It's true that uh, the patient with our patients also have neuro, I said that we don't use neurohormonal activation, but yes, they, they, they have an uh, activation of the neurohormones. This a study we did at the Bronton, we look at the coenta heart disease population with heart failure, and yes, they have an increase in BMP, an increase uh, um, running aldosterone, aldosterone as every other patient. The problem is there are patients, like patients with single ventricle, that may have in severe heart failure and having a normal VMP. So how to use the VMP in these patients, mainly in, mainly in the single ventricles, is if it's high, it's a problem. If it's low, you don't know. So you cannot be guided for what you are normally guided. So you have a patient with shortness of breath, you do a VMP, it's normal, let's get the respirators to fix the problem, it's not my problem. In coenta heart disease, doesn't, doesn't apply, and mainly in single ventricles. You can have a patient very sick in class three, a normal, a normal BMP. So the BMP helps if it's high, but doesn't help if it's low. But the really thing that helps, and this is something also I learned over the years, is their exercise intolerance. Following these patients with regular CPET is something that I do very often, and uh, I think is the, the if I have a single message today is just do CPETs very often in these patients, but be careful with the CPETs. When you do acquired heart disease and you go to the, acquired heart, to, to the transplant uh, rounds and say, well, what is the big VO2? Well, it depends because, you know, it's for you it's 10. If it's 10 for you, you have to transplant. If you have a, no a, a biventricular heart, you have 10, yeah, you need a new heart. The problem is in coenta heart disease, you see, this is a study we did at the Bronton, and look what is normal in patients that are not in heart failure. And you can see if you, are, if you have an arterial switch and a biventricular heart, probably your numbers are the same than any of us in this room. But if you have a, a, a fontan, 15 for a fontan might be okay. So, so the number, ca we cannot have a cutoff in coenta heart disease. We, we don't. What you have to do is do your single patient, monitor your single patient with their own peak VO2. And if drops, then find a reason why it drops. Have a case in yesterday, a patient that came to the half a clinic before I came here, thinking, well, I was expecting completely to have a transplant talk, and, and uh, because her PV2 had dropped in the previous exercise, in the, in, the, in the last year exercise. And I thought that was a problem with the conditioning. I, I, I gave her a chance, so we have a program, a rehab program for Fontan patients, so I enrolled her in the rehab program her PV2 increased by 20%, just with exercise. So be careful with a drop, just identify if there is something else before changing the heart that you can improve. The patient is now in class one, two, she's exercising four days a week, she feels better than ever, and there was a significant deconditioning that was leading to the, the data in the PV2. But it was clear that she was deteriorating. I thought that she she, uh, an exercise could be a, a, a fix, it worked. And, but not always work, but it's important to look at serial data and go in detail on your, uh, on your CPET. PVU2 is one number. So PVU2, I always tell the fellows, says nothing, or tells you nothing if you don't look at the oxygen pulse or your heart rate. If you have a patient that have a good strobe volume response, but a heart rate reserve is, is bad, then, well, maybe you wait a little bit longer to transplant that one, right? So exercise test, serial exercise test is definitely an important thing to compare with your own uh, uh, your patient with your, their own data and not having a cutoff. So we, uh, the, we realized that in, in, in London, when I was in London, and this is, I started this model when I came to Toronto, actually Toronto had exactly the same model that we had in London, which is uh, starting or concentrating this patient, these patients in an ACSD heart failure clinic. 
So this is what how Toronto or, or London worked before we, get, we got the, the heart failure clinic. So we had the heart function team, which was as everyone, every, every hospital, social workers, the heart transplant consultant uh, staff, the, the cardiovascular surgeons, the palliative care, the anesthesia, and we have the congenital heart disease system. They working completely independently. If we had someone that needed a heart transplant, we send it to them. Or if somebody from another program had a congenital heart disease patient for a transplant, the patient came to them. They assessed the patient, they made the decisions. In 2014, and this is by chance because both the Bronto and Toronto changed at the same time, we changed the model to this model. And the model is now we have an ACSD heart failure clinic and the patient comes to the ACSD heart failure clinic, which is run by two ACSD providers that are dual trained in ACSD and heart failure, which is one is me and another one is Dr. Roach. We, we own the patient and we are the one that coordinate the care with, the, of course, the heart transplant team the cardiovascular anesthesia team, the congenital heart disease palliative care. We have a congenital heart disease palliative care team just for the congenital heart disease patients. With the CV surgery and the bath team, of course, with our congenital surgeons. The patient come here, and from here, the patient uh, can be referred either for, by anybody in the team to the heart failure clinic, can be referred by the heart transplant staff, so now in our hospital, if, you, if, a, if a patient with congenital heart disease is referred for transplant assessment, doesn't happen anymore, but at the beginning, uh, the, the heart transplant team is still receiving the referrals. They would, refer, they would send the referral straight to us. And nowadays, all the referrals come to us, so every, all transplant assessment come to this heart failure clinic. Or any cardiologist from the community can refer. The first thing we do is to see if anything we can do to that patient that really needs a transplant, might actually might need an operation or might need medical adjustment, and we might fix the patient before the patient uh, goes to transplant assessment. This is what they see, when the ACSD training plays a significant role because you are training ACSD and you might identify things that you don't or, or you might not be able to if you are not ACSD trained. And what happened after this, the patient might go back to ACSD because actually there's nothing, this fixed, or, or, the ha or we found a problem and, and send the patient back. Not very often. More often than not, the patient stays with us and follow, is following the clinic until the transplant tank is this kind of patient that you know, okay, well, you're going to need a transplant. Just let's stay here and we, we follow you here. And some of them go straight to transplant assessment. And I will, do, I will go on more detail on the transplant assessment and how we do the transplant assessment. And we don't have any restrictions to who should come to this clinic, but we have some guidance to, for, for people to be aware. So we have, uh, our, in our unit, we follow 15,000 congenital heart disease patients. And, uh, and of course, all of us see single ventricles, and all of us see we have 550 fontans, and we are only two of us. So, so, so everyone sees fontans and sees systemic RVs. But we have some criteria, so every patient with systemic RV that have severe systemic RV f dysfunction should be in the heart failure clinic. Any patient with systemic RV and severe TR should be in the heart function clinic. And any patient that had a previous admission for heart failure should be in that, in that clinic. If you have a fontan, if you have a previous admission for heart failure for sure, but if patients with severely impaired systolic function or patients that you think any, the ACSD provider, provider patient have a fontan circulatory failure, and we could be another hour here talking about what fontan circulatory failure means, but we are very open. If you think your fontan is failing or your patient's fontan is not doing well, send it to us and we'll take care of the patient from now onwards. This patient will need a heart transplant anyway at some point. So, and, um, and uh, if the patient has, if you have a fontan with kidney dysfunction or liver dysfunction, should be in the heart failure clinic. I really worry about the kidneys in fontans because my, my condition, their transplant uh, outcomes, and therefore they should be followed in the heart failure clinic. And of course, any patient that is admitted uh, for heart failure in the program uh, is discharged to the heart failure clinic for an up titration and management that most of those patients normally, if they don't need a transplant later on, they will, be go, they will go back to their providers. And we cannot insist more that, you know, refer. It's better to refer early than not to refer or to refer late. So we never say no to any patient that comes to the clinic. Second lesson I learned. If you really want, so 
if you really want this to work, you cannot work alone. So, and that is true in any aspect of life. But you need to have, you know, we, the ACSD providers, we, we, we think that, you know, it's just the, con the congenital cardiologist. Well, actually, we are just a fraction of what the, our patients need. You need a team that have in their area, in their specific areas of medicine, expertise in congenital heart disease patients. And this is what we did, and this is our team. So, so and this is what was sustained our heart failure clinic. So, as I said, the heart function, pro the, 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 heart the heart failure program is run by, by Lucy Rhodes and myself. But we have an ACSD anesthetist team. So we have four anesthetists that, that they, they only do ACSD. Well, they do other things, but they are the ones, the only ones that do ACSD. Of course, your congenital seniors need to be part of your program. We, one thing we, we changed, uh, I, show, I will show you the, when, when we change the model, but when, one thing we changed is our congenital surgeons are our transplant surgeons. All the transplants are done by, the, by any of the four congenital surgeons. You need a strong mental health program in this, in this, uh, in the congenital heart disease heart failure patients. They are really uh, uh, have a lot of mental health issues, and we have uh, we are very lucky, and we have a dedicated palliative care staff to the heart failure team, who sees every single patient that is referred for transplant or those that are in the end stage of of the heart failure. And this this team we work extremely close together just with the aim of just improving the outcome of the congenital heart disease patients with heart failure. The good thing of having a, 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 a specific team is they do things in that area to improve the outcome of congenital heart disease patients. And this is an example of, of, of the change uh, in outcomes with, uh, with creating a, a, um, ACS, a ACSD or a congenital heart disease anesthesi anesthesia team. So our anesthetists until 2016 in the hospital, every congenital heart disease patient that had a heart surgery was anesthetized for whoever was in the rota and was in front of the patient that day. And was 40 anesthetists, and they anesthetized every single patient in an institution that has a large trajectory of congenital heart disease. In 2016, with the anesthesia team unilaterally decided to create a congenital heart disease anesthesia team, which is the four people that you saw, you saw there. So they have now. They created a pre-assessment clinic, so every patient that has a, a, a congenital heart disease surgery is seen in the anesthesia clinic by a, a, a congenital anesthetist. The patients are only anesthetized by congenital heart disease uh, anesthetists, and in the CVICU, the congenital heart disease anesthetists work very close with the CVICU staff. All of them do the CVICU, but if they are not on call, they, close, they work very close with them. And this is the change in survival. So this, the, the mortality changed from 4.3 to 1.1%, just creating a congenital heart disease system, which is, is that is, I cannot insist more in, cre in, in, in encouraging your other specialties to create esp 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 expertise in congenital heart disease, because also anesthetizing a fontan is not the same than anesthetizing an, an, a a patient with a uh, biventricular heart. So the expertise in their areas is only going to help you to improve your program. How is our process? So when we have a, a new referral for a, a transplant uh, assessment, come to the, as I said, come to the heart failure clinic that is run by, 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 uh, by the two providers. We do all the pre-assessment, all the consults, look at to the hepatologist, to the nephrologist, all the PRAs, all the bloods that you need to do. All, all the assessment is done in the, in the heart failure clinic. And after we send the patient, before even discussing them in rounds, to the congenital anesthetist and to the congenital surgeon for them to see them before discuss the patients in rounds. The first discussion happens in the congenital rounds. So we discuss the patient internally without talking to the transplant team, and we decide whether transplant is the best, is the way to go for that patient, or transplant is, we think that is already too high risk and we should not even going ahead with the transplant. Or actually, sometimes, well, look, this patient might benefit from operation, let's do an operation and not to transplant this patient. If the patient goes for an operation, stay with us, there's no, no, uh, no problem. If the patient is one of those that we decline transplant, then we discuss the patient in the rounds with the transplant, the standard transplant team, without then seeing the patient to see whether they agree or not. If they disagree, then we start the process and we do the full assessment. Normally, they don't. 
if the patient is accepted, uh, or if we think the patient is transplantable, then we refer the patient to the transplant team, to the heart, tra heart failure transplant team for them to see the patient as well. To the cardiovascular surgeons to have a second opinion for a non-congenital surgeon, although we are stopping to do, doing that because the cardiovascular surgeons are not joining the surgery anymore, so, so there is no much point. Of course, to the transplant coordinator to finish the other part of the social worker and the, uh, all, the all the assessment, no medical assessment for the transplant. And as I said, every patient is referred to palliative care. Just for the palliative care team role here is, uh, I personally think every patient deserves to know what happens if you don't have a transplant and you might want to die, which is, should be respected. But also they have a pivotal role in doing the advanced directives of every patient that goes for transplant. I'm very obsessed of having an advanced directive, who is going to make the decision, who is going to disconnect the machine <coughs> if, we, if something goes wrong. So, so, and that is a role that the palliative care team does. When all these people see the patient, then all together, we discuss the patient in the transplant rounds. The patient is presented by us. So either Dr. Roach or myself, depends if it's her patient or my patient. We present the patient. By them, everyone knows the patient. And we get an agreement all together, whether or not the patient is a, a candidate for transplant. I, I, I must say that if we said yes already, this only, in, I've been in Toronto six years, only one patient that we disagree in, in between us, that we, they, they, decide, they, they said that transplant was not a good option. Otherwise, 99% of the time, they agree with us. And what is probably different than many other programs is the patient is accepted and listed, stay with us. The patient don't stay with the transplant team. The transplant team, I see them occasionally, but I, we see them every month. They might see them every three or four months. Or, but uh, if it's a patient is stable, we see them maybe every three months, and they see them every six months. But actually, the drivers of the care of the management of the heart failure is under us. If the patient happened to be admitted, because some patients need to wait in hospital, they wait in hospital under the congenital heart disease team. We are the ones looking after the patient until the day of the transplant. And that m is a significant difference, mainly with the single ventricles, because the single ventricles have a very, roller, uh, a very tough time when they are waiting for the heart. And sometimes you have to look after the liver, you have to look after the kidney, the PLE is a problem. So the heart actually is the less of the problem. So, so the other things that you need an ACSD expertise uh, makes the, uh, an advantage to be under ACSD and not under, under heart failure. We are, a, we are not a consulting service, we are a meeting service, so we can have patients under, under our care. With this model, since we changed this model, actually we increased the numbers. We, transplant, we are transplanting more patients with this model because now you have all the, all the people that are looking at the patients are congenital heart disease providers, so it's easier to get the numbers up. But also we are transplanting more complex patients, so, so systemic RVs and fontans. But I think the most important part of this model is this. This is when we changed the model, and this is the mortality we had before the model. It was a 21% mortality at discharge, and we have changed significantly, almost reduced by half the mortality of the patients when they go home. So our survival is much better just having the expertise concentrated in a, uh, in a, in a congenital heart disease system. Third lesson I learned. If you want to have a transplant successful or a successful transplant, you have to optimize your patient as much as you can before the day of the transplant. So, of course, the heart is the easiest part. All of us are cardiologists. No? You give diuretics, you might give afterload reduction, you might have the patient on, on, on inotropes. We have the possibility of having these patients on inotropes at home, and they might wait at home on milrinone. And uh, for fontan patients, for example, we do not transplant or bear, I think we have done one transplant from home, uh, a fontan from home. Majority of the fontans are in-house, in not for the heart, but just for the other comorbidities that we need to control. So, of course, the PVR is something that uh, assessing PVR and monitoring PVR regularly is something that in acquired heart disease you guys do all the time. But we the, the vino vino collaterals and the AV collaterals is a problem that we only have in, in patients with cyanosis or single ventricle, and we close all of those before the transplant. We close the AV collaterals as soon as we know that the patient is going to be transplanted. We start to close AV collaterals. We don't close VV collaterals until the patient is listed. So when the patient is listed, just before, when we accept it, when we discuss it already with the transplant team and they already have agreed, then before, just before listing, we admit the patient, put the patient on inotropes, 
and uh, and uh, uh, start to coil uh, VV collaterals. The problem with the VV collaterals, you can drop cardiac output. You, it's, it's might be a, a, an issue with uh, the hemodynamic stability. You have to do it in hospital, and normally the patient stays and wait for the heart in hospital. And we do that every four months. If the patient uh, uh, has not received an organ in four months, we go again another run, another travel, another trip to the cath lab, and just find those collaterals. They open up. The collaterals are there for a reason. So, and the reason to do this is to reduce the risk of bleeding in the in the surgical field. That's one of the major risk factors of death in front and transplant. And this, since we are doing this, we have reduced significantly the risk of bleeding. I cannot be. Uh, I cannot insist more in, in looking after the, the, the kidney and the liver. I, I tell the patients when, as soon as you go to the transplant list, I change my heart. I, um, from a cardiologist, I become a nephrologist. Because it's, it's actually what I always tell, I, I think all of you know that with the liver and the heart are very good friends, but when the liver is happy, the, 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 sorry, the kidney and the heart are very, ha are very good friends. But when the, 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 when the heart is happy, the kidney is unhappy. And when the, the kidney is happy, the heart is unhappy. Well, if I'm going to transplant your heart, I'm sorry, my favorite organ is no, it's going to suffer. The heart is going to be unhappy, but your kidney has to be happy. So that is uh, something that I'm very obsessed with. And if you have to run with a little bit of extra fluid, you want to run with extra fluid. But your kidney is going to be no, no, preload, no, no uh, preload depleted, no with a high creatinine, because that is going to change your outcome in the transplant. Same with your liver. The liver is more challenging. But, uh, but in the patients with uh, Fontan, uh, you, you know, yeah, always we have to, to, be, uh, uh, to be able, uh, and you are able just not to get the liver too congested, and sometimes it's not, it's not possible, and we run these patients with less, n at least 50 or 100 of spinal lactone waiting for the, for, the heart, for the heart transplant. The, you need a high dose of spinal lactone. These are the, the single ventricles are the ones that do actually the biggest or the highest secondary hyperosteronism, so you want to keep that liver running. You have to also change your heart and become a liver doctor. I'm an awful liver doctor, so, but, uh, but uh, you have to, to look after that liver because that is when your, your outcome is. And we are super, super obsessed with PLE. I think that I, I never transplant somebody just for a PLE, just because of the sake of having PLE. It has to be a symptomatic PLE. But when somebody, we transplanted recently to patients with very, very severe cachectic type PLE, so patients very severe symptomatic PLE, and, and then in these patients we admit them and we try everything. Unfortunately, we do not have a lymphatic program in Toronto, so we cannot embolize lymphatics. If you have one, please do it and embolize everything you can because it's going to change your outcome. The PLE doesn't cure the day of the transplant. But we admit them and we try to do everything we can. This is the... the is, this is Natalia. She was transplanted um, at the end of last year. Natalia had a, a I'm not going to go through the history, but it's a single ventricle front tongue with a, with a very, ba very bad PLE since childhood. I met her in 2019 in a, in a flare of, P in a mission for a PLE flare. Started her on, on, on Midodrin and uh, uh, actually controlled her PLE for a while. Trioctotri didn't tolerate. Sildenafil uh, she tolerated, didn't make a difference. When I tried to her on steroids, first case ever in my life, I hope the last one, that she's allergic to steroids. I said, what? That, that cannot happen, and that, that, that doesn't exist. We, treat, we, tr the, we tried three different steroids. Every time she got red, and this uh, 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 super, super allergic to steroids. Well, transplant is over. So I managed to talk to the, allerg the allergy team, and they said, well, we can desensitize her. So the des we managed to desensitize her from, from steroid uh, allergy. She became super symptomatic with the PLE, a PLE that bled. Every time she had a PLE flare, she, her hemoglobin would drop to six, just with, with bleeding. Be, be, and we, at the beginning, we thought that was a cut problem until three, uh, I think it was the, at the third admission, said, well, this must, must be the PLE. And actually, a capsule uh, endoscopy showed uh, bleeding in the ileum, which is where the PLE more, is more prominent. And this, we I just agreed that all of us agreed was PLE. I said, well, we have to transplant this girl, otherwise she's going to die. So we admitted her, and we throw at that PLE everything. So apart from sildenafil, because just to avoid her masoplegia after transplant. And this is what happened. So uh, Natalia was admitted with 500 
of uh, milliliters from 24 hours of alpha-1 antitrypsin clearance, but she was transplanted with, with 13. So, so is the PLE cure? It's not. But is the PLE control? Yes. Is you have, uh, if I transplant Natalia here, she, her, she would have a much higher risk, a higher risk of mortality than if you transplant somebody with the PLE completely controlled. She was transplanted, a month was at home, and what happened now? She has PLE every time that she has a problem. So the patient, she's still in my clinic transplanted because I'm still managing her PLE right now until, you know, the PLE, is, the published data said that it takes a year to go back to normal. But that is a patient that, as I said, you transplant a fontan, you change the heart, you're still having a fontan body that takes a year or, or two years to go back to normal. The last lesson that I learned is just have your protocol or your process completely standardized. You have to do things standard the same way every time for them, for things not to fail and not to change the way you, the, the way you choose your, your patient. So what happens if we have a new organ? The offer, goes, the offer goes to the transplant coordinator. If the pa first patient on the list is a congenital patient, then come to us, to the congenital heart disease uh, um, staff, to the congenital heart disease surgeon, and to the transplant staff. And we have this commitment that doesn't matter where we are in the world. Lucy and I, uh, one of us is always in town, but doesn't matter where I am in the world. If we have an offer tonight, I, I'm in Houston, I will be in that text message with my surgeon and with Lucy, looking at the offer and making the decision whether or not we take this heart. And we are the ones that decide whether or not we take the organ. It's not the transplant team. And based on whatever, it depends on the patient. If it's a fontan, we have a three hours ischemic time for the fontan. We don't take hearts more than 40 years for a fontan or more than three hours ischemic time. So, 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 so we control all the factors depending on who is the patient or if the risk of re-entry, if the surgeon is, the, the organ might be, might, be log, might be closed, but the surgeon is uh, a, a, a reconstruction of three hours or two hours. So then we take all these factors into account and we decide, well, find the heart is, we take the heart, we discuss it with the heart failure team, the heart failure team agree. And then we, the patient is transferred to ICU, we do the right, if the patient is a right heart cuff, it's done by, AC, by the ACSD team. And if we need some lines, we might line the patient already in the cath lab at the time of, uh, of the catheter. But the most important thing, I think, is, is our pre-transplant meeting. So what we do is uh, whoever is, is uh, in, uh, if neither Lucy, uh, or, uh, either Lucy or, or I, if, even we, if we are not on call, we just uh, available for this. If, uh, and one of us coordinates the transplant meeting. This is a meeting where we meet is the ACSD cardiologist, is the heart transplant cardiologist, is the ACSD anesthetist, is the congenital heart disease surgeon, is the retrieval team, whoever is going to, uh, to get the heart, if it's a staff or a resident or fellow, whoever, or, uh, and the CVC ICU uh, um, staff on call, and of course our fellows are there. And what we do in this meeting is we go through the case, so this is the patient, these are the risk, and we decide what is gonna, how the process is going to be. Does the patient need a catheter, a, a catheter before the surgery? Yes, well, we do the catheter, we organize the catheter. What lines the patient needs? So we go through the vascular axis and see what problems might or might not face, and if the patient needs, uh, needs some lines prior, pre before getting to the OR, we just line the patient just not to have any surprises in the OR. We leave a bus cath in every single fountain, so if we're gonna do a catheter through the groin, just better leave the bus cath there already and, and just don't punch on the patient twice. And, uh, and what happened? I need to reconstruct the, the aorta, or I need to reconstruct the PA, so well, please bring me more PA or bring me more pericardium, or look, uh, it's a patient with a bilateral SVC and I, or, a dest or a situs inversus, I need the nominate to reconstruct. So all of that goes to the retrieval team to make sure that we bring exactly what we need and not to have surprises on the, in the OR time. The second thing, and I think is you know, my, I, was, I, I feel useless when in the OR, but I'm in the OR as soon as the patient goes into the OR, but my role in the OR is to be the communicator between the retrieval team and the, and the OR team. We try and we almost, I say 90% or 95% of the time, we manage to, to determine the cross clamp in the donor just to reduce the ischemic time. So we cross clamp when the team are, uh, are, are ready to go, just the, is the, already the heart is dissected, everything is, is dry, the patient is not bleeding, we are ready to go on bypass if we, if we need to go. 
and then is when we cross clamp and to minimize our ischemic time. That's my basic role until until the heart comes. And after it's just the 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 T and the heart assessment. But but pre transplant is just controlling that cross clamp time just to minimize your ischemic time. And after the transplant. This is a, a very, very uh, massive teamwork. So, so I normally stay uh, in house for the first 24 hours. The last transplant was three weeks ago, it was 36 hours because it was very sick until the patient is really stable. And it's a very close collaboration between us, transplant, the, the heart transplant team, the intensivist and the connected heart disease surgeon. So, but, but it's not that we abandon the patient there. So we are still managing the patient, we run together for until the patient is out of the CVICU every single day, we all of us run together at the same time to, you know, the, I, I, the, the patient is transplanted already and the heart transplant is dry, but there are things of PLE, how to manage the PLE, or, or, or things of the congenital heart disease that is still there that you need the congenital heart disease expertise. So just, this is my last slide, so take home messages, yes, HSD is prevalent and it's, it's, a, it's a, a increased the mortality. Patients have often more uh, than not have atypical symptoms, so look for that atypical symptoms, and that is the main reason that they benefit from having a longitudinal follow-up in the HSD heart failure clinic, which where you should refer your patient early. And uh, if I have to give one message in that clinic, do serial exercise testing is really, really helpful. Your BMP, as I said, if it's high, it's fine. If it's low, just yes, next thing, ignore it. Build ACSD dedicated teams. I think that is one of my biggest experiences, just having a team that works and, and speaks the same language than you. Optimize your heart failure patients before go. I think that survival is not, is, is not just in the OR. The surgeons are very gifted. It's not just in the CVICU. It's if you take somebody very sick and, and not completely optimize, the, the survival is going to be worse. And try to make your process as a standard as possible, having always involved the same people, but just, just to, you, you, gain, you gain expertise, the more you do this, and the more you repeat the process, the more expertise you gain. And just thank you to my team. This is uh, it's part of my team. All, all the surgeons are there, but, uh, and thank you very much for having me. And uh, if you have any questions, happy to answer. Thank you, Rafa, for a phenomenal, masterful lecture and for sharing years of gain experience over of sweat and tears <laughs> so uh, we're gonna open we have a few minutes for questions so we're gonna open um huey first and then ryan rafa that was absolutely phenomenal um congratulations on the amazing accomplishments and thank you so much for sharing um, your amazing knowledge base that you've learned from this process um, it seems to me that one of the hardest challenges from what you've described, in addition to really creating the multidisciplinary um, interaction, but is even before you get there, which is getting the patients in early. Can you share with us a little bit of your experience of how you've managed to start to get the patients in early to your ACHD heart failure clinic and how you communicate that message to referring providers, your ACH team, other ACHD teams around you? So at the beginning was very hard. So <coughs> I didn't leave the beginnings of Toronto because I was in London, but I can tell you what happened in London. At the beginning is hard because people are not used to send the patients to another ACSD provider. That's the first problem within your team. Is the, it's actually easier to get referrals from outside because it's every, everyone is happy to send the patients to, to somebody that look after these patients than from your own team because they are not used to send the patients to you. But what I learned over the years, now we in the heart failure clinic in Toronto is 10 years, it's already 10 years old. And now it's, it's just giving that message in every single round. Every time that a patient appears, they well, like actually, you know, that patient might, might benefit from coming to the heart failure clinic if you want. You know, I'm happy, I'm here. Also, not take ownership because it's important to share care with whoever is the provider that been looking after that patient for 20 years. But, uh, but over time, actually now, they are very open to refer. And it's just, just uh, you, every time you can, you say, well, just please think about it. And uh, over time becomes normal. So now, actually, uh, it's very standard that if we discuss um, somebody in rounds and is in heart failure, the standard, the patient comes to the heart failure clinic. And majority of the times, we take over the care and uh, stay with us. So it's, it's just giving the message continuously. From outside providers, now our heart failure clinic became quite 
uh, standard and, and popular. And also because we do all the transplant assessments, it's too easy, easier to get all, 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 all those patients in through us. The, the heart transplant team agreed not to assess these patients. And then, then uh, the external providers know that if you have coronary heart disease and you have heart failure and you want to refer, you don't refer to the transplant team. Or the heart failure team, they come to the heart failure program. And then they, I, they, we just put them in the heart failure clinic. It's just saying too many times to just end it, that you have this clinic and this, this service is here. Uh, transplant cardiologist interested in ACHT transplant. Uh, so I have two questions from you. One, pro from the programmatic standpoint, you know, as, as you, you said, you know, these patients are very high risk, high, you know, mortality early on, you know, when we trans transplant a single ventricle fontan with a full-blown PLE and hard to manage, weekly paracentesis, we know these patients are very high risk. Okay, so how do you, uh, you know, talk to your program and how to get the program on board to transplant this, this patient and uh, accept the risk. And especially, you know, we do a lot of multi-organ transplants here too. So now we also trying to convince the liver team and the kidney team to give their, their organ to this patient at very high risk. How, how do you approach that with your program? That's, that's one question. The second question is, uh, you nicely talked about how putting a, a team together to, uh, assess this patient and get them listed and follow them. Uh, there's a lot of also care post-operatively, especially, you know, this patient is very different and the, in the ICU. Um, do you have a, a special process to take care of these patients separately from the ICU staff and from the hospital care, especially in, in the adult setting hospital? So <clears throat> to your first question that I think that it was hard. So when I started in, in London, the, the half a Latin didn't want to take the risk. And uh, um, it and was, was very hard. In Toronto, it's this year. And what has changed really in Toronto is that is our, last year, our outcomes were better than the, the, non, the, the acquired heart disease patients. So our survival was better, and we only transplanted in Fontans last year. So that is a quite strong point. We have a review of the program last year and uh, uh, an external review. And surprisingly, the external review said that we should not stop doing SSD heart failure transplant in Toronto because our survival, Fontan survival is 91% at one year. So I think it's not, it's, it's how you convince your program is I think it's like this. If you have a team looking after these patients, you change your outcomes. So, so is if you, these patients are very sick, but if they are looked after in the correct environment, they, they become less sick at the time of transplant. And then your outcomes are better, and then your program buys into it. And that's how we have done it. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm very convinced that, that many of our patients that, that uh, we haven't lost, we would lose them if we hadn't had this, all these people looking after with expertise in going to heart disease. At the beginning, it was very hard. Also, you know, uh, we're set, uh, and we are not risk reverse, so we almost transplant anyone that can be transplantable. But, uh, but uh, and the program, I have to say, they are very supportive. They know that they have to pay, uh, to pay at all, that because these patients have a higher mortality. But, uh, but overall, because the outcomes are changed significantly in the mortality, when we, have, when we changed that thing that in 2014, is because the program was about to stop going to have this transplant because the mortality was too high. So ha something needed to be done. And when we did it and the mortality half, then th they, they said, well, this is acceptable. Since then, the mortality is even better. And, and, uh, and then it's been quite easy, to be honest. I have be I'm very lucky. They never say no. If we say yes, we never say no. The second question, yes, we have a different, uh, the, the way we do it is, is our CVICU is very used to, do, to look after coronary heart disease patients. So we, ha we, we do around 120 open uh, heart surgeries for ACSD a year. So they are really familiar with all these kind of patients. So they are not afraid of looking after coronary heart disease patients. And they, are, and they know how to, how complex is a fontan and what comp problems they can have. But the difference with these patients is we, the ACSD providers, are super involved in the care of these patients postoperatively. So I'm driving all the PLE care or I'm driving all the complex coronary heart disease problems that they might have after surgery, as you said. 
is driven, is driven, is driven by me or Lucy. What we do is, even if you are not on call, we divide it by weeks. So this week is me. And then if it's a transplant, I'm there every single day. This week is her. And it's, she's uh, there every single day. And every single decision, even going on ECMO after transplant, is a shared decision with us. So, so that's, that's the, the, the only difference. When the patient's out of the unit, then if it's, uh, the patient goes back to the transplant team, except for the fontans with PLE that stay with us as well, but it's a shared care. But for the CVICU admission, it's a daily interaction with HCSD and heart transplant, daily. So that's, uh, uh, it's very, prov uh, uh, we don't step in anybody's toes because it's completely different. I, m what I provide to the team is completely different what they provide to the, to the, to the patients. And we respect each other and we've been working together for so long that we, even when I, I came to Toronto, it was already very well established and our relationship is even better now and we know where the line is. So this is my, this, you know, I can offer this, you can offer this and we listen to each other and that changed significantly the, the management of these patients, I think. That's, that's my experience. When I started in London, I was alone and it was hard. And the, CV, and the ICU team didn't listen to me. And that was hard. And then they did things that we don't do now because they listen to us. So I mean, I'm very present in CVICU anyway because of the, of the number of patients we, we operate. And so it's a team that I work with them every day for other reasons too. So it's not alien for them to see me in the unit and uh, because it's a transplant. And if it's a transplant, they expect me to, see the, the, to be in the unit. The first night, I'm, I, the first 24 hours, I stay in the hospital. I don't leave the hospital when, I, when there is a coronary heart disease transplant. And that is because the first 24 hours, there are a lot of things that are not just related to the new heart, but related to the previous condition. So, I don't know, I, you might, you, a patient with fontan might not tolerate a liver, an insult on the liver as good as a uh, acquired heart disease patient. So you have to act on, if the lactate is high and it's not clear, and it's not peeing, but just, uh, just put the patient on dialysis now and not wait until tomorrow morning because by tomorrow morning I lost the patient already. So, so I'm there and every hour I make decisions until I see that the patient is already going in the right direction. But the first, as you know, the first six to eight hours are very hard on these patients. And we, both of us are by the bedside with the patient for the six or eight hours that happens. standing presentation. I want to ask you which is the role in, in, your, uh, in your practice to VAD uh, patients with a heart failure as a congenital patient? So, so we, we had, uh, had VAD before in the past. Since I'm in Toronto, we haven't VAD anybody. Uh, we are super open to it. We haven't had the patient to do it. So we have managed to, get to, to transplant the patient before needing a VAD. But uh, the role of VAT, I think, is the same role that you have in acquired heart disease. You have a, a biventricular heart with high PVR. Uh, uh, is definitely um, uh, the, the best patient to VAT. But if we always give them a chance to be transplanted. So because VAT in this patient is not without risk, and then you might just add a risk and increase the PRAs on the patients, and then you might lose the opportunity to, tra to transplant. We haven't bought any fontans because, to be honest, it's just because the fontan that really goes well with BAT is the one which has a, dis a, a ventricular dysfunction, and that's the fontan that all of us want to have, but most of the fontans will be transplanted lately are fontans with normal ventricular function or mildly impaired ventricular function, where BAT is not really a role. But yes, it's something we have there, but we, uh, and we can use it it's, uh, as part of the BAT program. The BAT program is completely part of all these discussions and uh, on board with this, but we haven't had the patient that we needed to do it. We have one last question, Dr. Bim Rush. No, thank you. Uh, it's a very tough space in the field as it's evolving. Uh, and again, we've seen our transition with addition of our ACHD team uh, and, and the ICHD transplants have increased. Uh, but my, my question is specific to risk prediction in this population. And to start with, advanced heart failure is tough to be referred. We're already in heart failure the last 10 years we still struggle with patients coming in late, in general acquired heart failure. So adding on ACHD heart failure makes the physiology much more complicated. Um, but at least in the field of heart failure, we've, I feel we've made a dent in trying to validate risk prognostication by looking at alternative survival compared to transplant. 
Seattle heart failure score is one which still not that used, but we're using indexes and other admissions and other things. But in ACHD population, your VO2 max, if you the data that you showed gives you a if you're less than fifty percent, gives you a one year survival of ninety percent. That is actually quite high and you wouldn't transplant somebody at that stage. So my question is the physiology is complex. You probably need a multivariate model. Uh, and I think I've seen a few papers on Seattle heart failure, and it doesn't hold good in this population. So is there a Toronto heart failure ACHD <laughs> score that you're working on? I wish. Or? I wish. So you have a very valid question, a very valid point. The problem is that uh, we've been, I think we've been trying to look at this broadly. I don't think it's, we can look at this as ACHD heart failure population. I think we need to look at patients with biventricular heart systemic LV, which your prognostic is probably the same than your patients. Biventricular heart systemic RV, where your pronostic is going to be determined for your pulmonary hypertension, which is the main, one of the biggest problems. And the problem with the systemic RVs, they deteriorate like overnight. So they, you just look at them, they are okay, and in two months you have no patient, you cannot transplant them. And the third and the hardest to develop is the FONTA. It's the patient with single ventricle. I think that we don't know. We don't have a, a score that, that uh, um, how long you're going to live for. The problem is, I, how I look at this is, I am going to tra- I'm gonna be able to transplant you if, I don't, if, if, I con- if you continue deteriorating like this. That's, that's, that's how, how I, I see a FONTA. So yes, I, we might transplant. So you might refer earlier, and, but what is an early in a fontan? It's a failing heart. It's a heart that is not going to last. So what, what is early? Because yes, you are OK. Your liver is now OK. You're, 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 you, you cannot work already, but if you are at home, you are stable. But if I wait and you develop ascites and your PLE gets worse, then your transplant survival is even worse. And you have a heart that is not going to last. So. It's a difficult line, and we don't have the answer. And I think we will not have it. I think with mainly with the single ventricles, we have to change completely th- the way to look at them. It's not how long you're going to survive with this heart. It's how I, I'm going to be able to transplant you if I wait longer with this heart. Or I'm going to lose the opportunity of transplanting you. Because you're going to need a transplant. So of course, you ha- don't want to transplant too early. But if you are already deteriorating and you follow somebody in clinic and you have one year, the fontan deteriorate over time. It's not a fontan, a patient that you come, start to deteriorate, you transplant. No, it start deteriorating over time, and you see that they're getting worse and worse. Do I wait until the liver is already a problem, or the kidney is a problem? No, I don't. So I think that's how, you ha- how you, I look at it. It's like, I'm not going to be able to transplant you if I wait longer. And don't get me wrong, last two months ago, we transplanted a 57-year-old fontan. So, so it's not like we transplant everyone with 20. That was an RA2P fontan and, uh, and was transplanted with 57. So it was a late fontan. But, uh, but it's just, if you do well, do well. But if you don't do well and you want to lose your opportunity of transplanting, then it's better to refer them for transplant. That's how I, how I think we have to, to think about it. Thank you so much, Rafa. This was outstanding. Thank you, everybody.